overall class schedule. Next week we will do, deal with the entire book of Leviticus. It's hard to believe that we are already halfway through the course. Then the seventh week we'll deal with the book of Numbers, which is the time when the Israelites were wandering around in the desert. And then the final week, Deuteronomy, uh, the first hour, and then final exam. Is there a red REC in the window? Great, thank you. Um, should have mentioned that before. So we, of course, are dealing with the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. We have looked at Genesis already in two sections. Um, and then, because it's clearly broken up in two sections, the, uh, the primeval um, prologue before history and then the patriarchs. Today we are dealing with Exodus. Last week we looked at the act of the Exodus, the thing that gives this book the name, that is the leaving out uh, of Egypt as God inspired Moses to go back and be the great leader that would, uh, by God's power, take the Israelites out of captivity and slavery in Egypt. And that takes us through the first 18 chapters, which we looked at last week. So God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt is what we've already looked at. Today we're going to talk about the establishing of his covenant law. And then, of course, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy we will deal with later. Um, the book of Exodus, I gave you this outline before. We do believe the author to be Moses. That's the traditional interpretation. Um, sometime around 14... Uh, 46 to 1440 is when we believe that, that this occurred. It's during the time period when, when the Israelites came out of Egypt and then leading up to Mount Sinai. Um, the key word is redemption. Last week we looked at the first three sections of this outline. And as I said last week, Exodus is not broken up in clean divisions the way Genesis is. Genesis, there's a little literary formula, that Toledo, that separates it into ten sections. Um, this doesn't have the same thing, but still, because of the two great acts, that is the Exodus and the law. So to, last week we looked at the first three. Today we're going to look at the law, which is uh, chapters 19 to 24, and then tabernacle and worship, the, the instruction from God for the creation of the Jewish tabernacle, uh, which would be God's residence on earth in the presence of his people, the Israelites, and then uh, as they began to apply that in terms of worship. Now, um, give you one more outline here. This is, all of this stuff will be, I should have said that earlier, this will be, uh, Carolyn is not here, and so um, this is not online yet. If anybody tried to find it before the class started, but we'll get it up there probably tonight. So um, I've, I'm not sure how she links this onto the website, and that's the part I couldn't do. I left a message forward, she hasn't gotten back to me yet. So this first redemption from Egypt, again, goes through the first 18 chapters. And then at chapter 19 to 40, is the revelation from God, which is the covenant, and then the response of the Israelites in worship of the covenant. It is the law or legislation, instruction it can also be called. It occurs in Mount Sinai, and it's over about a 10-month period. Last week, we looked at, really, very quickly, from the time of Joseph to the time of Moses, is 400 years. Um, uh, just under 400 years. And then Moses' time in the desert, his return, and then the two months during which he... They're traveling in the desert after they cross the Red Sea, and God is preserving them. He preserves them from the, uh, the, the local people, the Amalekites. He gives them fresh water when they need it. He provides quail and manna when they need food. So he preserves them in the wilderness until they get to Mount Sinai. So this is the section we're going to be talking about today. Okay. Um, we looked at a couple of these maps before, having to do with the Exodus and the idea of where did they cross... Where did they cross the Red Sea? There are some people who say they crossed at the Bitter Lake, Great Bitter Lake. Some say the north end of uh, the Gulf in the Red Sea here. And Mount Sinai, this is the traditional location of Mount Sinai, which is where, where we are today in terms of our discussion. There's a mountain there called Jebel Musa, which means the mountain of Moses. It has traditionally been considered the site of Mount Sinai. It was first named that by Helena, who was the daughter of Emperor Constantine, who came to the Holy Land, and she's the one who decided, this is where Jesus was born, this is where Jesus was crucified, this is where Jesus was buried, this is where Mount Sinai was. Um, and she considered that just God's revelation to her. And that's always been the tradition since then. There's a very strong tradition that it may be over here, uh, Jabal Allah's, as, and you'll see on this map, alternate location of Mount Sinai, so that the Israelites came and they crossed the Gulf of Aqaba, which really is part of the Red Sea, instead of one of these sweetwater lakes up here. Um, 
And I mentioned to you last week, this is a view that a lot of people are considering now that instead of going down here, because this is where Jebel Musa is, they crossed over, crossed the Gulf of Aqba, part of the Red Sea here, and then Mount Sinai is Jebel Allah's here. I'm inclined toward that, based upon a lot of the stuff that I've read recently. I just got a videotape. A friend of mine gave me a, 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 videotape, a DVD uh, in Seattle that addresses what, the evidence for that, which I haven't had a chance to look at yet, so I'll let you know what I find out. Maybe we'll have a video viewing uh, some night. So. Um, so they leave Egypt. They cross the wilderness um, of the Sinai Peninsula and either ended up down here somewhere or then crossed the, the Gulf of Aqaba into what, it, what we know today as Saudi Arabia uh, to this area. And then later on, of course, they'll head up north to Kadesh Barnea and then up into the Holy Land, which is up here. Okay, any questions about any of that? So where we find ourselves today is the Israelites have just arrived at Mount Sinai after God has preserved them in the wilderness, fed them, given them water, defended them from their enemies, uh, or given them the ability to defend themselves from their enemies, to be most, most accurate. And then after the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea, um, or Reed Sea, the scholars would insist on Yam Suf, which is what the Hebrew says is actually Reed Sea. It got translated to Red Sea when they translated it into Greek. But. All right. Um, first thing we want to talk about at the very start of chapter 19 is the arrival at Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, first, starting in the first verse. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what they are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Now this chapter 19, uh, it's pretty widely agreed that uh, the most important chapters of the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament, would be Genesis 3, which is the story of the fall, that's how we understand the human condition, and then Exodus 19 to 24. Chapter 19 gives us the declaration of God's covenant with the, uh, the Israelites under Moses. He had promised Abraham that he would make a people. Well, the people are there now. And now God establishes a covenant with them as his very special chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And then from here, chapters 19 to 24, we then get chapter 20, unwraps the Ten Commandments, and then we uh, the what's called the, the Book of the Covenant, where they uh, sort of unwrap what those Ten Commandments mean. We'll talk about that in a minute. But those chapters of the Old Testament, Exodus 19 to 24, and then picking up Genesis 3, are almost certainly the most important chapters of the Old Testament. If you want to focus on what the real key message of the Old Testament are, Genesis 3, Exodus 19 to 24. Here, God declares his intention to have a special covenant with the Israelites from this point forward. He made a promise to Abraham. I will give you a people, I will give you a land. Now he makes a covenant with a whole people with Moses as their spokesperson. It's very interesting here, you'll notice it says, um, these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. One of the things that God does very clearly is he wants to establish Moses as being the leader of the Israelites. He used him miraculously to bring the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt, and now over and over and over again through the Pentateuch, and sometimes a few times even later on in the prophets when they're quoting what happened back then, it will say, and the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, so he was the spokesperson. He was the mediator of the message. And they really did see him as a mediator. In fact, at one point, the people are so afraid of all the noise, the thunder, and the light, and everything happened on the mountain, they go, uh, Moses, you go talk to him, because if we talk to him, we'll die. But they trust that Moses is able to be in communication. <coughs> so they come to Sinai. 
they begin to, um, Moses gets a message from God, come up here on this mountain, which wherever that mountain was, and let me talk to you. And then he says to, to Moses, I am going to make you the leader of this people. I'm going to make this people my holy nation, my chosen people. This is where the idea of a chosen people, even more strongly than Abraham's covenant, this is where the idea of a chosen people comes from. Now, that message carries through all of Scripture. When I say that, that Exodus 19 to 24 and, and Genesis 3 are the most important chapters in the Old Testament, they're foundational everything in the New Testament too, and so they're, they're critically important there. First Peter, uh, Peter uh, echoes this same sentiment about the holy nation when he says of Christians, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Okay, compare that, the idea of being a chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, and go back and look at what, what God had said all the way back in Exodus 19. You know, 1,500 years before, Peter is writing this. And he said to the Israelites, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured position. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be... For me, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Peter later says, we as Christians, because we were adopted into the, into the family of the Israelites. We are grafted onto that vine, Paul says. We too become a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Almost exactly the same language that God had used for the Israelites uh, in, when he establishes his covenant with them in Exodus 19. Okay? Any questions about that? All right, so we have the arrival um, to the mountain. God summons Moses. He gives them this declaration. There is a point to be made about the fact that God says, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then this is what will happen. All, out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. If you obey my commandments. Now, the reason this isn't really a casuistic system as the question was asked by Guillermo earlier, is God did not wait for them to be righteous in order to redeem them. He has already redeemed them. You know, He made of them a great nation. Then when they fell under slavery in Egypt, He redeemed them by bringing them out of slavery. He protected them in the wilderness by allowing them to cross miraculously in front of Pharaoh and his chariots across the Red Sea and then preserving them giving them water and food and protection from enemies in the desert. He's already redeemed them. He has already shown that he is taking care of them, <clears throat> that they are his special possession. Now he expects, in order for the relationship to continue to be a unique relationship between the one true God and the chosen people, they are expected to be obedient to his commandments. And so we get the now if you obey. It's true that as they proceed down through the history of the uh, Israelites, their whole history is uh, one episode after another of them un being, able to, uh, being unable to keep their promise. Because they do make a promise. Here at the bottom, after Moses took God's word back to the Israelites and said, this is what God is proposing to you. We have the people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. So Moses is, you know, he's jockeying back and forth with God's word to the Israelites and the Israelites' response back to God. There is another place in this same section of the series of chapters where they do it again. They say the same thing again. We will be obedient to all the things God has said. So they have said, yes, we will live up to this commitment if God will be our God in that way. And in doing this, they establish the unique Mosaic Covenant. Um, a covenant is a relationship that is established. It's a relationship that doesn't naturally exist. For instance, a, a covenant between a, a father and a son would not be called a covenant necessarily, because it's, it's where two parties, they don't have a natural linked to one another necessarily. We talk about the covenant of marriage, but we've sort of overlaid the idea of being a mutual commitment. Um, and, you know, a husband and wife 
are not supposed to be closely related to each other. Um, they are they're separate entities, separate parties who come together with a covenant. Well, similarly, any covenant is when two not two parties that don't have a naturally existing relationship come together and swear an oath to each other that each of them will be committed to the relationship and that they will fulfill certain obligations related to that. Um, here in Exodus 19, Israel is being summoned to a special relationship of covenant with God. And God identifies that there will be three phases or three aspects of that covenant relationship from the, from the side of the people. They will become his special possession among the people. That's the chosen people part. They will become a kingdom of priests, which meant every Jew was supposed to be set aside as a holy representative of God to the world. Every Jew was supposed to be like a priest. And then finally, a holy nation, that they as an entire nation would represent what it meant to have a holy relationship with God, to be set aside, set apart, different from, and attuned to the desire and will of God. To be holy means to be, uh, to be aware of and motivated by the righteousness of God. And so they were to be a chosen people, a special possession, they were to be a kingdom of priests, and they were to be then together a holy nation. Now, Israel completely accepts that, as we have here, we will do everything that God has laid out for us. Then later on, that is affirmed, that oath that they make is affirmed by sacrifice and the sprinkling of blood. And that becomes a reminder of the fact that this covenant is a matter of life and death. It, they really are committing their whole lives to be the people of God, the chosen people. And it is really life and death. And as I said earlier, the entire history of the, of the Israelites after that, of, of, the, Isra, of the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, has, is time after time after time they fail to fulfill this obligation that they, they swore themselves to. And God has to bring judgment on them, and then he forgives them and takes them back, and they're okay for a while, and then they forget again, and they fall away, and have false gods or whatever it is. Again, some people, I, I find a lot of Christians have this idea that the, the Old Testament is about law and judgment and, you know, this sort of harsh, obey the rules kind of thing. And the New Testament is about grace and mercy and God's love and sacrifice of Jesus. But again, th this is not about judgment. The premise of this is grace. God has already demonstrated his side of the deal. He has already paid it forward, to use that expression. He has already shown his commitment to the Israelites, to love them and to care for them, to have them as his people. And now he says, and if, if you want to continue this relationship, there's a certain way you need to act. And they, can, and they pledge to that and they continually fail. And yet God continues to take them back and they fail and he takes them back and they fail. The Old Testament is, is in terms of number of times that God's grace and mercy is demonstrated, is astonishingly more often than in the New Testament. Although we have the great act of sacrifice and grace that comes in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So the idea that the Old Testament is about law and judgment and the New Testament is about grace is a complete misreading of the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament is based upon God's merciful grace to his special people, the Israelites. And then periodically we also get examples of his mercy and grace to other people, you know, like the Ninevites um, from Jonah and, the, and Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon and various others. All people are, are God's people and when they will listen to him, okay? Now, it's worth noting that this covenant agreement, as starting here and as we go forward, follows a very specific formula. A lot of the archaeological research that's been done since then, where they've found various um, uh, texts that are, most of them written on clay because other materials don't last very long, especially Hittite documents, from the 13th and 14th century BC, so we're talking about right around, you know, very close to this time, have demonstrated that there were certain formulas that were followed in creating covenant agreements. Particularly one, which we talked about in the class last year, our last term, is the suzerain vassal treaty. Suzerain is another name for king, and a vassal is a subject. Well, the suzerain vassal treaties that existed in the Hittite uh, texts in the 14th and 13th century BC, they start with a preamble that identifies the author and his titles, like um, Moses went up to God, this is what you're to say to the descendants of Jacob when you see them. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt. Um, and then later on, he sort of establishes his name in the start of the Ten Commandments. 
you know, uh, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of captivity in Egypt, and you will have no other gods before me. We'll look at that in a minute. The idea of identifying the, the, the one who's writing this covenant, and then secondly, beginning to establish some historical uh, prologue. In other words, what's been our past relationship? So when he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of slavery in Egypt, he's establishing who he is and what he's already done, what the nature of the relationship has already been. That it then goes on to stipulations of the treaty, like a basic demand for allegiance, you shall have no other gods before me. And then the other stipulations, here the way, here's the way you're supposed to act. There are provisions for where the text is supposed to be kept. In this case, the Ten Commandments, the, which are the core to the covenant agreement, were kept in the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies. And then there are curses and blessings. You know, if you do this, here's how you'll be blessed. If you violate this covenant, here's how you'll be cursed. Well, the, um, the now if you obey in verse 5 here, is sort of the conditional thing. Now, if you obey, here's how you're going to be blessed. I'm going to make you my special people, a holy priesthood, a holy nation. Um, and then later on, there are more details about how you'll be punished if you violate these things. And God does have to come back and punish them um, as they continue to violate this relationship through the whole history of the, the nation of Israel. Then, continuing from here, we have the appearance of the Holy Lord. Um, this is the theophany. Theophany is an appearance of God or a divine appearance. Exodus 19, starting with verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. This is one of the claims that people make about um, Jabal al-Laws in Saudi Arabia, is the whole top of the mountain is black. And the stones that it appear to have been burnt, and it's still that way today. Um, and the indication, some people would say, fits the description of God descending on that mountain in fire. Um, the smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, for the Lord will break out, or the Lord will break out against them. So again, God is emphasizing the fact that Moses is to be his spokesperson. He will speak to Moses, and Moses will then communicate that to the people. Having established that he's communicating with Moses, he then takes us to what is called the Decalogue in theological terms. If you ever see the word Decalogue, it literally means the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments. Decalogue is the Ten Commandments. So we then have God revealing the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue to Moses. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. There's the, the, the part of the covenant agreement where the, the one who's initiating the document, the more powerful of the two in the, in the covenant agreement, establishes his name or presence, and then what his history is, that he brought, us, brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Here are the restrictions parts. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not work, you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor your foreigner residing, nor the, any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, this is the first uh, four of the commandments. No other gods before me, no image of anything to be worshipped under heaven uh, or on the earth or in the waters beneath. 
Don't misuse the name of the Lord our God, and it literally means don't use it uh, lightly. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it for granted. It doesn't just mean don't, don't use it in a profanity. It means don't ever use it if you don't mean it, because this is important. And then finally, keep the Sabbath day holy. Quite often, you will read that these four commandments have to do with the relationship with God, and the other six have to do with the relationship with, with people. I don't think that's accurate. Um, I'm not the only one who doesn't think that's accurate, but if you heard my series of sermons called The Great Positives, um, I this is all I can get on one screen without making it too small to read, but I believe that the first five commandments are all about a relationship with God, and the second five are about a relationship with people, and I'll tell you why. Um, these are the, the last six of the commandments. Um, Commandment number five is honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. I'm going to stop there. I believe that's actually a commandment about being obedient to God because it has to do with being obedient to those whom God has put in authority over you. In effect, mother and father are the earthly representatives of God. When you're a baby, you know, you, you may have smarted off when you got old enough to talk and have your own will. But when you're an infant, infant, your parents take care of you, you are dependent upon them. As you grow up, more so in those days than now, um, they have authority over you. And that authority is given by God because only God can make a baby, ultimately. You know, parents have a part in it. But the idea that parents are, the, the family is ordained by God as the natural building block of society. And parents have authority over their children. That really is an echo of the authority that God has over all of his creation. And so, and I believe that. That's, that's how I preached it. I believe the first five, including honor your father and your mother, have to do with our relationship with God and the authority of God and, in the case of uh, number five, authority of those that God has put over us. Okay? And that's why that's important, to be obedient to your parents. Then the second five, you shall not commit, you shall not murder, and literally in the Hebrew, these are two words. It's no murder. Then you shall not commit adultery is literally no adultery. You shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, uh, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, or his his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Those are the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten, the Decalogue. And it continues, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled in fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Only Moses had either permission or apparently the bravery to go up on that mountain. I mean, you read, you read the description a moment ago that fire and thunder and lightning and, you know, loud noises and everything else. And God says, Moses, come up here. And Moses went. And you're going, okay, we can see now why Moses was, was such a strong leader. You know, he, he trusted God and he went against all probably his natural instinct to want to get away from that. Um, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. I think that's a very important point. The fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. In modern times especially, everybody wants to think of God as being, you know, um, my, my pal, my buddy. You know, God's my friend. This sort of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, forgetting that he drove the tax collectors and money changers out of the temple. Um, the whole idea, the principle here, we have lost in modern times, and that is... When we lose the fear of God, we lose a lot of the motivation that we have for not sinning. We have to have at least a healthy, awesome, remember the word awful means to be full of awe. Okay. So God is an awful God in terms of he is a God that generates a sense of awe. And we need to have a sense of that awe. We need to have a sense of the awesomeness of God. We need to have a healthy fear of God. And people say, well, when it says fear the Lord your God, it really means love. No, it doesn't. It means fear. In the same way that you may have a boss that you really like and who's been very good to you, but you know that if you mess up, that boss will fire you and you're not going to have money to eat. Okay? There is a kind of appropriate and healthy, not negative, but actually healthy fear. You know, I have a fear of sticking my hand on a hot burner on the stove. Why? Because I know it's going to hurt me. 
That we need to have the same kind of fear of God. To, to violate the will of God is something we should be afraid of. And it is that fear, as Moses says, that will help keep us from sinning. Now, a lot of what keeps us from sinning is, is a desire to <laughs> respond gratefully to God for all that He's done for us. And that's the positive side, and that's wonderful. But there is a, a negative side, too, and we need to be aware of that. Um, the, the Crocodile Dundee movie, where they're out in the wilderness, you know, in this beautiful location and everything else, and, you know, the, his, the person that's with him says, you know, it just makes you think about the beauty of God. And, and Crocodile Dundee says, yeah, me and God, we're mates. No, you're not. God is not your mate. He is, he is an awesome God. And he loves you, and he allows you to come to, into his presence. And in the case of the Israelites, he has chosen them to be a special people. But let's make no mistake. God is God, and they are not. God is God, and we are not. Let us never confuse that and think he's just one of the crowd. Right? One of the other things about this that's critically important is that in this covenant relationship, God has expressed his commitment to the Israelites by bringing them up out of captivity in Egypt, by protecting them and blessing them and making them his chosen people. But there is no onus on God to have to do anything in this relationship. The, the, um, any impinging or any requirements that are, that are made are on the Israelites, not on God. Now you will notice in the Ten Commandments, there's nothing anywhere that says, oh, and if I, God, don't fulfill my side of it, well, you can whip me. There's no downside for God. There's no way that God will be judged against that. God is without peer. He is without judge. There is no one who can call him to accountability. There is no accountability built into this for God for the very simple reason that God is God and they are not. And we need to understand the requirements are all on the Isra Israelite side. It is not on God's side. God does it not because he has to. He shows mercy and he chooses and he blesses because he wants to. Because it reflects his nature. His merciful and loving and gracious nature. Not because there are any requirements on him in this thing. Do you see that difference? And yet there are requirements for the Israelites. They are expected to live in a certain way. Now... A very important point I think that people often don't get is that the Ten Commandments by themselves, the Decalogue by itself, was never intended to be to institute a system of legal observances. This is not the law. The Ten Commandments. And the reason we say that is because um, if it was law, then there would be more specific actions required. You know, the law doesn't say, um, for instance, the, 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 the traffic code of law it doesn't say you need to have respect for all the other drivers on the road. No. It says stop at stoplights, stop at stop signals, don't drive over a certain speed. You know, it's got certain things that you have to do and that you can't do. But it doesn't have the sense that this has, which is a much more general kind of thing. Um, and there's no penalties to this. Uh, ascribed in the Ten Commandments. It is much more a moral code than it is a law. It's a way we ought to perceive how we live our lives. And this is why the moral code of the Ten Commandments, with the possible exception of keeping the Sabbath, the principle behind keeping the Sabbath, and that is recognizing that God is the creator of all things and he runs all things and, he, and that he doesn't want us to be driven all the time, but rather to have, that he loves us enough, he wants us to have some rest. All of them have to do with truths that still may, are maintained today. It's still not okay to take from someone else just because you want it. It's still not okay to commit to violate your your trust commitment to your spouse and have relations with some somebody who's not your spouse, etc. All those things still hold. Whereas the particulars of the law, the Mosaic law, we are no longer bound, bound by. We can eat shellfish. We can eat pork. You know, mm, bacon. Okay. So the particulars of that and the punishments for not doing those things no longer hold us. But the moral code that exists in the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, still holds for all people for all time. And virtually every culture that has ever existed has had some version of this. Even if the particular, even if they didn't 
that didn't have anything about eating pork, even if they didn't have anything about not working on the Sabbath, they would have some sense that you shouldn't kill people, you shouldn't commit adultery, you shouldn't lie, you know, you, you need to respect the deity, whatever you were saying the deity to me, etc. Okay? So this by itself is not a legal code. And God's side of the Ten Commandments, the part he had, you know, his side of, of the activity, he's already done. Redemption has already occurred by this point. And here God is giving us a general moral code as to how we then should live out our lives. And again, the whole history of, of Israel is the idea that they continually fail to meet these obligations. They continue, for instance, the worst thing that they do is to violate the first commandment, you will have no other gods before me. Because the Israelites, once they entered Canaan, once they entered the promised land, they worship Canaanite gods every time you turn around. They're worshiping false gods. Because that was the gods of the local Canaanites. And, and their women were pretty. And so they worshiped the gods because of the women. That's why Solomon fell into, uh, into sin. It's because he married foreign women who worshiped foreign gods, and he not only allowed it, he, after a while, encouraged it. So, uh, but this idea that we obey God's will in order to be that special people, in order to respond to the redemption God has already provided, knowing that God's wrath could fall, God's protection could be taken away, and that ultimately, and, and the ultimate punishment for failing to obey God, the ultimate sign that God's blessing had been taken away, is exile. We've talked before about the fact that the Jewish idea of salvation their definition of salvation in the Jewish faith is to be returned from exile. It doesn't have to, it's not to be, you know, saved from hell. It's to be returned from exile, to be brought back home, the place they should have been all along. And so the ultimate punishment for not being obedient to God was to be sent into exile, which happens to the Israelites several times through their history because of that. So the Ten Commandments, I think we need to see not as laws in any kind of modern sense, because they're not carefully defined. They're sort of general moral ideas. And they don't have any penalties. There's no legal policy behind the Ten Commandments per se. But immediately following the Ten Commandments, we get into a section, and this is from um, the chapter 20, right after this, verse, two, verse 23, through chapter 23, verse 33. So that's 2023 to 2333. is a section of Exodus that's called the Book of the Covenant. The Book of the Covenant is where God does start to give more specific instructions. Okay, I've given you this broad stroke moral law, and there's no idea of penalties or anything like that, just a general moral code. Now let's get into specifics about how you live like that, about how you're supposed to act specifically in order to fulfill these things. And so um, we, we, be, we get this Book of the Covenant, which is the first of the more specific laws that God gives. Let's look at the first part of that. Again, here are the passages, 2022 or 23. I think I had 22 because he sets it up. And then through 2333. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites this. There it is again. There's that formula where God always chooses to speak through Moses. And I think uh, primarily in order to clearly establish that Moses is the authority. That Moses is the leader that God has selected. So they'll know who to listen to. Tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make, any, uh, do not make for yourself gods of silver or gods of gold. Here he starts getting into more specifics. Make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones, for you will defile it if you use to a tool on it. Do not go up to, the, to my altar on steps, or your private parts may be exposed. Very practical. Okay? You, you're wearing a robe, you climb steps, somebody's behind you, oh! You know, kilts. Here we, kilts. Here we get into very practical kinds of details. And then, these are the laws you are to set before them. And there's a colon here, because this then gets into the body of the Book of the Covenant, which are more specific laws. I gave you this because it just introduces it, but you begin to see that it already starts giving specifics. Don't use dressed stones when you build an altar. You use raw stones, which I made, not that you made, so that you're not going to say, oh, look at that wonderful altar that I was responsible for. It is God's altar, not yours. You know, you need to be careful that when you're 
when you're approaching worship, you do so modestly. Don't do something that's going to be immodest, like you know, walking up steps so somebody sees your private parts. Okay, <laughs> very practical. And that's the way the Book of the Covenant then picks it up and starts giving us very specific kinds of instructions as to how it is that we are supposed to be obedient to God. How the big moral code of the Decalogue gets fulfilled in how we live our lives in specific ways. Again, it would be like the difference of saying, you need to drive carefully and respect other drivers, versus here's how you do that. Don't speed, don't run through stop signs, don't cut other drivers off, and if you do, the, the standard fine for this is you know, $55 the first time, $125 the second time, and the third time you take your license. Very specific kinds of punishments associated with that. That's where we get into much more so with the, the Book of the Covenant. Any questions about that? Bob? Uh, I've got to come in and I have several questions. Okay. Uh, the loud noise, the fire, the smoke, the charred rock on top of the uh, mountain. Obviously, a rocket ship landed there. Yeah, some people have said that. Uh, it's but, aliens. <laughs> it's always aliens. But a um, uh, question about the Sabbath. Is there any indication that the uh, Israelites observed the Sabbath before Sinai? <clears throat> Uh, no, they had not been given the commandment to do that. They, they didn't have any indication that they should have one day a week that they set aside. So Sinai, uh, the Mosaic Law, is the first place where God said, I don't want you to forget that I made everything that is. And I also don't, you, you just came out of slavery in Egypt. And where you had to work seven days a week, whenever your boss told you to, your owner told you to. And I want you to know that you're not a beast of burden, that you're my special creation. So I want you to honor all of my creation, and I want you to recognize you are honored as the high point of my creation by taking one day off to commemorate the fact that I rested on the seventh day, and to give yourself a break so that you can study and pray and worship. Okay? Because there are some groups like uh, Seventh-day Adventists, for instance, who claim that the Sabbath was observed consistently from the week of creation by... I don't see where the evidence for that. I, I, I don't see that. I don't know where they would get that. Did you have something about that one before we come back to it? Uh, about about the, the purpose of the Sabbath. Um, um, there seems to be Brueggemann says that there's a there's a, 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 a an economic element in this thing as well. That while they were in the in the desert, they would they would demonstrate and they would see clearly that God was their sustainer. By collecting for six days and not not collecting on the seventh day, right. and there was an economic element in that because they were going to Canaan, where not only were correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I I've, I've, I've read, um, where in Canaan they not only were faced with beautiful women and faced with the idols, but there was an economic system there too that was in contrast to this 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 uh, all that. God is giving Moses right here as far as treating well your neighbor, taking right. care of the orphan and the widows and that sort of thing. And and Brueggemann says that the one of the the fruits of this beginning to learn and to live and to adapt this um, this Sabbath was to demonstrate to the Canaanite culture that there was an alternative. There was a there was a, a God that provided for them, and they did not have to fall into this this acquisition type, economic type right. lifestyle that forced and worked seven days a week and made all this stuff. So. Yeah, I think that's true, and I think that that's always been a sense that, in the same way that when we when we fast, we are saying that God can can sustain us even if we don't do the things that most people feel like they have to do. Most people in our culture, they you say you're not going to eat for a day, and they think, what is wrong with you? Are you nuts? Get the doctor. Without <laughs> recognizing that, you know, I think when Jesus said that uh, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, I think he may have meant that literally. Mm -hmm. That there are sus there is sustenance for us that is not what people usually think. And I agree too. The idea that. Taking a Sabbath day and not working, not earning, not doing anything on that day is a sign of faith. It's a declaration that I know God's going to take care of me and, I, and He told me to take a day of rest and I'm going to do it without any fear that that's going to compromise my ability to make a living. And so you do it as an act of faith. Um, and the example you gave is, is consistent with that, that, that He told the Israelites when they were supposed to collect manna. And you know, this may be a place 
This may be where they get some of that because manna happened before the Decalogue. Manna happened before the Ten Commandments. And he said, collect, go out every morning and collect what you need for the day. And on the sixth day, collect enough manna for two days. And don't go collect any on the seventh day. Well, people who collected more than they were supposed to, thinking they would have some left over and they could eat more, then it went bad and had maggots in it and stuff the next day. They tried to hoard. They tried yeah, exactly. To I mean, they will gather, gather up as much as we can instead of because God told them how much they should eat each day. But when they gathered it up on the sixth day and carried it, over, got enough twice as much to carry it on the seventh day, then it then it was fine. It didn't go bad. Um, so that's a suggestion. I hadn't thought about this before, Bob, but that's a suggestion that there was some acknowledgement of there, there being a special seventh day. But we have no record other than that that I'm aware of that would come to mind of where there was any acknowledgement of the seventh day as being in any way special. But that that at least in that case, God did say. Collect six days, and the sixth day collect enough for the seventh day. Don't go collect it on the seventh day. So, but back to Bob. Go. Yeah, another question that I have related to the height of the mountains, either the, the traditional or the alternate. Do we know approximately how tall they were, and are there walking paths that go up either of those mountains to the top? Um, we do know how tall they are because they're both accessible. I've seen photographs of them. I don't know off the top of my head how tall they are. Um, but um, Jabal Musa, which is in the Sinai Peninsula, is more accessible, but politically accessible. The uh, Jabal Alaus in Saudi Arabia is not as accessible. I mean, I've seen photographs of it. I know people have gone there. Uh, there's been research done there. But it's not as accessible because it's part of Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia, being a Muslim country, is not real keen on either Jews or, Gen or Christians verifying you know, their, their stories, their beliefs. And so there's been a tendency for them not to allow people there. Um, in fact, part of Jabal Laws has barbed wire around it. You know, they have fences and posts, guard posts and stuff because they don't want people around there. Um, there's a, there is a location, uh, again, I've seen some of the video, there's a location where there are, it looks like a sacrificial platform has been built at the foot of Jabal al -Laz, and on it there are these petroglyphs that are carved out and that look like the same kind of glyphs that were used in the hieroglyphics in Egypt for the, the god uh, Hathor, which was the, the cow god. And the, the, the suggestion has been made, there's no absolute proof of this, but the suggestion is that may have been the uh, altar that they built, we're going to look at that in a minute, the altar that Aaron had built to put the golden calf on, and that the people were scra uh, scratching on the stones there, petroglyphs are just scratched marks on stones, of the symbol for Hathor, the god of Egypt, that they where they just left from, the god of Egypt that came in the shape of a cow. Um, but so, yeah, there's, I, I, we could look up how tall is Jabal Musa or how tall is Jabal al -Laz, but. Um, Jabal al -Laz, I don't think, has a way you can walk up, but Jabal Musa probably. The, the foot of Jabal Musa, the traditional Mount Sinai, is, uh, is the monastery of St. Catherine, which is where uh, the, the, uh, one of the oldest of the, the texts that we have, the Codex Sinaiaticus, uh, was found. The story is that uh, they finally let somebody in there because you're not allowed to go in. It's, it's uh, closed off. You know, you, there's no door. You have to go over the wall. You know, they lift you up over the wall to get in there. Um, and that somebody was allowed in, and he saw them starting fires, and they were using kindling. They were using these old pieces of parchment and stuff, and when they checked it out, it turned out to be one of the oldest texts, extant texts that we have, Codex Sinaiticus. Now, the monastery claimed, no, that wasn't really happening. You know, we're not that stupid, but that's where the story goes. Now, one more, and then we'll go back. The reason for the question is, it seems like, an impressive physical task for a lady plus a time to walk up to the top of this mountain and back down, particularly a whole bunch of times, but particularly carrying yeah. a tablet of stone. Right. Yeah. Um, now he lived to be 120, so he's still only two thirds of the way through, um, and apparently he's in pretty good shape because he'd already walked from Egypt. You know, he, he's, he's walked back and forth a couple times from Egypt to Midian. Which, as I say, it's either the Southern Sinai Peninsula and or um, this area near where we're talking about it with Jabal al -Laz in Saudi Arabia. And so he walked there when he was 40. He walked back when he was 80. He did all this stuff with Pharaoh. He led him out, you know, on foot, uh, crossing the Red Sea and then across the Sinai Peninsula. So apparently he's in pretty good shape. 
Um, you know, that's how he gets more than 10,000 steps a day. Um, but yeah, it's, it would be quite impressive. But he did live to 120, so he's probably still in pretty good shape at 80. Okay, um, let's take a break. We now want to talk about um, after God had given the law, he then established a, pre a, a way in which he was going to relate in a very practical presence kind of way with his people. And he did it through the building of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> Let me start out by reading from Exodus 25, starting with the first verse. The Lord said to Moses, and I, I skip a little bit in here where it's got some details about using certain kinds of you know, colors and things like that. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. Very interesting comment. An offering from every man whose heart prompts him to give. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Have them make a chest of acacia wood two and a half cubits long. A cubit is about a foot and a half. So you get the idea. Two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put the ark in the testimony, which uh, then put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. This is a description of the ark of the covenant. Of course, you all have all, I'm sure, seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Mm -hmm. Indiana Jones, because they have an ark of the covenant in there, and I've got some images for you. Then I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, for those of you who like pictures, is that the real one? That's the real one. We took a photograph just last week. No, <laughs> this is a replica based upon the description of it. And uh, yes, um, I was looking on YouTube. Of course, I don't know what's you know, doing it, but there's this guy. He's got a Bible that they found this in the wall that they think that used to be around um, um, well it was one of around the ancient city of where Solomon was that they found like under, like there was like a underground caves like where somebody may have fled when does there. he claim they found it huh? when does he claim they found like, it uh, like a year or two ago Sure, I sure haven't heard about it. You I think, know. You think we all know. Um, they, they, they claim, he claims he found it in the wall and handed it over to the whoever. Okay. Well, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the best idea people have is that there's a place in Ethiopia where it resides now. There is a location there that nobody is allowed into that is guarded and has been guarded by the Ethiopian Coptic Church for you know, several thousand years long before Jesus that had somebody guarding this location and nobody's allowed in um, and it's that's the traditional residing place we don't know where it is the ark of, that, that's why it's Raiders of the Lost Ark because we don't know where it is it's lost um, but yeah I haven't heard anything about that um, there, there were claims that you know about the Templars you know the Knights Templar they the, the full name of the Knights Templar were, were Knights um, Knights of the Temple of Solomon because they, they were part of the Crusaders, and when they went to Israel, they were protecting pilgrims on their way to and from the Holy Land. They were given quarters uh, that were just below where the Temple of Solomon had been. And so the claim had always been that they found treasure under there, and that that's how the, that's how the Templars became so wealthy, because they really were wealthy. They were the richest group in Europe. Um, and, um, you know, if anybody was going to find anything under the Temple of Solomon, I would have thought they would have. But, a couple of other images. Again, you get the idea. This box, and it would have been somewhere um, three and a half feet long, a little over two feet tall, a little over two feet wide, with these acacia poles with two cherubim on top. The area below the wings of the cherubim is um, the location where they would put the blood for the atonement. Um, it was called the mercy seat. And that's where they would pour the blood during the Day of Atonement. This was the place. Inside it, the only thing that was supposed to go in it was 
the testimony, which were the tablets of the Ten Commandments, and um, I believe they, they also made, kept in there a jar of manna that was miraculously maintained. It didn't go bad like the others had, as a sign of God's blessing to his people. Guillermo, did you have a question? No. Okay. So It also had Aaron's rod. And Aaron's rod, yes, that he had used in, in the... So this is what... Roughly speaking, you know, these are artists' conceptions of the description of what the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to look like. We don't know exactly. Um, these cherubim on top, again, most people think of cherubim as being, you know, cherubs. The, the, the little fat guys that shoot arrows at, at uh, Valentine's Day. No. Cherubim, by all accounts, were, so, were apparently quite ferocious looking. Uh, they, that's one of the orders of angels. And uh, they are warrior angels. And so the cherubim were considered... Very powerful, uh, not little chubby, almost naked angels with little, little bows and arrows. Okay, that's the wrong idea. This is what the tabernacle was to look like. Now, the tabernacle was a portable shrine because it was given to the to the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they toted this thing around for the next forty years plus. In fact, the tabernacle continued uh, toted it around the desert even when they got into the Holy Land. The tabernacle continued to exist up until the time when Solomon built the temple. This was um, the shrine to God. It was made from um, a square lattice work. That's what this is. The walls, the two side walls and the back were a lattice work of acacia wood covered with two large linen curtains. And there are very specific instructions about how this is to be done. In fact, chapter 25 through 31 of Exodus. So the, those seven chapters are very specific instructions from God to Moses as to how to make this thing. Then we have a little break in there. The golden calf episode is, is chapter 32 through 34. And then in chapters 35 to 40, we get almost all the exact stuff because it's describing how Moses followed in exact detail all of the instructions that he got earlier from God in having this thing built. Um, and so you have... The, the, the whole thing was about 45 feet long, the equivalent of about 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. Two-thirds of it, or 30 uh, feet of it, was called the, um, the holy place. That was the sort of entry area. Then the back one-third, which would have been 15 feet square approximately, was the holy of holies, or most holy place. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept in that holy of holies, or most holy place. Now, later on, when they built the temple, they replicated this same layout in the temple, only with solid walls and everything. In this case, it was made with walls that could be taken apart, and it, it was covered with cloth, and then over top of the cloth, there were, there were actually four different layers of cloth and hide that was supposed to cover the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and there was a screen curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place, and then another screen on the front of it. Um, the priests would go in there for pouring, you know, um, to pour the blood on the mercy seat on top of the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Um, so this was a shrine to God, and God actually said, I will dwell here. In fact, if this was the Ark of the Covenant, he said, my presence will dwell above the mercy seat. So above where the cherubim were on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, Ron? Uh, part of the de description of the hides were uh, sea cow. Sea cow, manatee. Yeah, man I thought of manatee. In well, I don't know if they had manatees in that part, part of the world. Part of the what? What did you say? Sea cows. Yeah. Was in the the, those four layers, I said there were four layers of cloth and, and, and animal hide. Well, it describes the animal hide as being sea cow hides. Now, I don't know if what they call the sea cow is the same thing we call the sea cow, which today it's a manatee. Manatees only exist in, like, the Caribbean area, as far as I know. They may exist somewhere else. Doesn't one version call it porpoise skin? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, I I sea one cow is more translated. I've never heard of sea cow. Yeah. Porpoise skin. Uh, sea cow is what I always write. Eric? Um, they also tied rope around the priest's leg, is that right? Or? Well, the, this happened later in the temple. I don't know that they okay. did this in the tabernacle, but the idea was once a year on the Day of Atonement, the, the high priest would go in. He was responsible for going in and uh, taking the sacrificial blood. The blood was, it was sacrificed outside. I'll show you a bigger map in a minute. Um, and he would go in and pour the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat. 
the Israelites always had a fear, because they, I guess they knew how sinful they were, that at some point God might not accept the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement, and that it might take it out on the high priest. And so the story was, and I don't know if this is a fact or not, but I've heard the same thing, that they would tie a rope around the high priest's ankle so that if he really got in trouble with God, they'd try to pull him out. Yeah. Um, I feel like I've read that. Then yeah, I have, I have so, too. Didn't it say in, in Exodus that when he was giving instructions to Moses that they were to put something like bells on the bottom of their garment. Along the road hands, yes. Yeah. So yeah. they could hear them and it got quiet. <laughs> you know it's something was wrong. You know. <laughs> well, the idea is that this... Uh, oh, yes, Ron, go ahead. This, just, um, they took this apart when they transported Yes. It? And in fact, what they would do is, God, you'll remember that when they uh, left Egypt... God was in the fire by night, the column of fire by night, and the cloud, uh, the pillar of, of cloud by day. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, here when the they were when they were camping out in the desert for forty plus years, whenever the cloud of the presence of God was over the tabernacle, then they stayed there. When it left, they'd say, "Okay, time to go," and that was the signal that God wanted them to move. And then it would precede them. It would they follow it as it went off. So. So this, and in fact, we say tabernacle. Tabernacle is actually, um, if you've ever heard of tenting, all right, or tabernacling, it means to stay with, okay, to be with. And so the tabernacle was literally the place that God was to be with his people. It was going to be his home. It was a sanctuary for God in the midst of his people. When we say in the midst of his people, they give very specific instructions for how this was to be laid out. This is the courtyard. This, this is the part I just showed you, which is the actual tabernacle. This is the courtyard of the tabernacle, which was about, it's 100 cubits, or about 150 uh, feet this way. And uh, in this direction, it would be seven, about 75 feet, or 20, 23 meters, or approximately 50 cubits. You would have the tabernacle. There was a brass laver, which was a large water container. A bronze altar, where they could, um, over a fire, so they could roast meat, which was part of the instruction. They were also, then they would do the sacrifice of animals here. Um, then each of the tribes was assigned where they're supposed to be around this. So very literally, the tabernacle was in the middle of the Israelites. You have um, Naphtali, the tribe of Asher, the tribe of Dan, of Issachar, Judah, Zebulun, Reuben, Simeon, Gad, Benjamin, Manasseh, and Ephraim. All of them were supposed to be, and it gives instructions that when they when they got up to leave, there was a certain order they were supposed to follow. So this didn't end up being just chaos. The instructions from God are very specific in all this. This is one artist's idea of what it might have looked like at night. So you've got the tribes of the Israelites camped around it, according to the various tribes in various locations. You've got, this is, a, all the way around the courtyard, there was a, a fabric screen, that, uh, curtains that were 15 feet tall. The actual tabernacle was 15 feet tall. And so you would have the uh, labor and the altar, and they would do sacrifice of animals here to take the blood in. So this would have been the, the courtyard of the tabernacle that would exist in the middle, and they, they did that for many, many years. Exact instructions. As I say, God, between chapters 25 and 31, God gives the instructions on how all this was to be made and done and set up and used. And then they repeat everything almost verbatim again when they describe them actually doing it. In order to demonstrate, we followed exactly the details that were given, and that's chapter 35 and 40. So, this was very important to them because it literally meant this is where God was. The fact that God's presence would be over the tabernacle, this shows sort of the column of fire kind of thing at night, um, that God would demonstrate that he was in their midst, he was present with them, he would dwell with them, are the words that's used here in Exodus. Um, at, and the tabernacle would be the site of that. And the they would know that, that when they saw the, the column of fire at night or the pillar of uh, smoke in the day or cloud, then God was present with them. Okay? Now, then in between the instructions for the building of the tabernacle and the actual building of the tabernacle, we have uh, Exodus 32 to 34. It is um, a horrendous little <laughs> episode in which the Israelites prove unequivocally that they are not going to be faithful, but they're part of the bargain. It is the episode of the golden calf. 
God has, has promised them they're his people. He's told them how he, what he expects of them and how they need to obey him in very specific terms. First broad stroke in the Ten Commandments and then specifically in the Book of the Covenant. He's then given them instructions on how he will be present with them and how they're to worship him in the tabernacle. <clears throat> and then we come to this. Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing. Remember, these are earrings that they got from the Egyptians. They plundered Egypt uh, before they left. They asked for gifts of all these things, and God inclined the Egyptians to give to them. So it says they plundered Egypt. And bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what he, they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. So he put a lot of work into this. And that's going to be important in a minute. Then they said, These are your God, then he, they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Who brought you up out of Egypt? Remember the Ten Commandments? I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of slavery in the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Tonight we're going to party. Tomorrow we'll go to church. That's sort of what he's saying. So the next day, the people arose early and, burnt sac and, sacrificed, and, and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in reverie. Uh, revelry, not reverie. Revelry. Um, they start worshiping a false idol. And Aaron, Moses' brother, who was part of the whole deal, the mouthpiece of Moses, um, is the one who leads him in this. They ask him, you don't get any suggestion that he argued with them or fought them or you know they had to hold him down to make him agree to it or anything else. He just goes along with it. So this is a clear violation of the covenant agreement that God has just established with the Israelites in which he has given them exact details on how they're to serve him. The first and most important thing they're not supposed to do is have no other gods before him. And second closest to that is you will make, make no graven images of anything else to worship. Bang, bang. One, two. Okay. Um, Moses, while he is up on the mountain, God says to Moses, oh, I'm going to show you. This is an artist's conception of that. Worshiping the golden calf. Obviously Greek influenced, because I don't think that Israelites dress like Greeks. But um, when, when Moses is up on the mountain still talking to God, God says all of a sudden, Moses, these people are worshiping false idols. Already they have violated the agreement with me. And so I, God says, I'm going to destroy them. And you and I will start all over with a new people, Moses. Moses intercedes for them and says, please don't kill them. You know, give us another chance. Let me talk to them. I'll straighten them out. And so Moses pleads with Yahweh not to blot out the Israelites. So he comes back down the mountain at that point, and he deals with them. Um, and here we have Moses' reaction. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned, and in fact, uh, Joshua, who's with Moses during this, Joshua was the assistant to Moses, who later took over when Moses died. That's why we have the book of Joshua after the Pentateuch. Joshua hears all this noise, and he goes, there's the sound of battle in the camp. <laughs> and Moses says, no, I don't think that's battle. And he, as they get closer, people are singing and playing music and dancing. Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing. His anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. This is a symbol of the covenant with God being having been broken by the Israelites. They have violated the covenant. It is broken. And he took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Do not be angry, my lord, Aaron answered. Now, Moses was the younger brother. Okay, and yet... Aaron recognized Moses' selection, and he says, Don't be angry, my lord. 
You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, Whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold. Okay, we're good up to then. That's all accurate. But Aaron then says, And I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> Moses saw that the people were running wild, and that Aaron had let them get out of control, and so became become a laughing stock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. This is why the Levites later become the priestly tribe. Okay? Um, the, when they enter the Holy Land, they are not given, the Levites, the tribe of Levi, are not given a, an allotment <coughs> of land to fulfill. The whole tribe is told, you will be given cities and places to graze your, your um, animals, but your focus is on the temple, and your income will not come from the lands that you have. Your income will come from the temple, and everybody else will support you because of that. The, the, the confirmation of the establishment of the Levites as the priestly tribe happens here. Well, all the Levites gather around Moses. They take their swords, and Moses sends them through the camp, killing people as judgment. And then there is a plague that comes on. So there's a dual punishment that comes. Now, it sounds pretty awful, you know, that, that God, God and Moses have the uh, Levites kill a bunch of people, and then a plague comes on. But the point is that all of them deserve to die at that point, at least all of them that had worshipped the calf. And so the fact that 3,000, that's how many, were killed, um, is fairly minimal compared to what could have been and what they deserved. And it was a way that God had to make a point. You know, that you don't, you don't just try to slap God in the face and get away with it. Because He's God. And so this is one of those places where God has to demonstrate there are consequences for defying me and for violating the trust. I, I've shown my good faith, God says, in all I've done for you so far. And you do this. I have to make a point. And so he does. Um, after that, God, uh, Moses ascends the mountain again, and when he ascends the mountain, he again intercedes for the people. He pleads with, with Yahweh, God, to forgive them, to uh, give them a reprieve, and God agrees. God gives them a reprieve, and um, we, he agrees that, all right, I will forgive them. Because you asked Moses, I will let that happen. And we'll move on from here. There then is an interesting little passage in here about the tent of meeting. It talks about, now this is not the same tent of meeting, which is an expression that's used for the tabernacle at one point. Uh, but it talks about the fact that Moses and others can go out to the tent of meeting and, and talk with God directly. And it was outside the camp, so it's a different, different thing. And it's only mentioned this one place, and there's no real explanation. But apparently there was some location where God also would make his presence known, where both Moses and even other people could go and talk with God and get, get feedback on stuff. All right? Interesting little thing. Well, Moses continues to intercede with Yahweh. He promises that he will, um, he will make sure they tell the line. God had said part of the judgment against them was that he would no longer be present with them. That he, his presence wouldn't be there, but he would, he'd forgive them so far that he would send an angel on ahead of them to prepare the land for them, take care of them. Moses continues to plead with, with God and say, please don't, don't take your presence away. And so God finally agrees that he will continue to maintain his presence. And, and when they talk about the presence of God, that doesn't mean God physically showed up. Because at one point, um, God says to Moses, no one can see my face and live. C.S. Lewis observed the reason in the Beatitudes it says that blessed are the pure in spirit for they shall see God. It's because only the pure in spirit could see God and live. Right, that there's something about that. And yet the presence of God, the, the Shekinah glory it's called, the Shekinah presence of God is evident in the tabernacle. It is evident, and so God makes his presence known, although it's not a physical presence, like if one of us had showed up. Okay? But God does, and he demonstrates the power of intercessory prayer because he answers Moses' prayer of intercession and says, yes, I will, I will, Continue to be with you as you go along. I won't desert you and just send an angel. I will continue to be there. 
Um, but God recognizes that these are uh, stiff-necked, stubbornly sinful people, and yet he doesn't destroy them. He continues to uh, show his goodwill, his good faith. And in fact, in chapter 34, we have this statement of God's commitment, his recommitment to the covenant that the Israelites have just violated. Uh, verses 6 and 7 says, The Lord, the Lord, this would be Yahweh, the proper name of God in the Hebrew. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon their children and upon the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So what does that mean? God, who is abounding in steadfast love, faithful, gracious, slow to anger, uh, steadfast in love to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty. And it talks about children and children's children. I think what that means is God will forgive us. But there's sometimes as consequences to our sin that will affect us and our children and on down the line. You know, you, you sin against God and you can be forgiven of that sin, but there may be consequences. You commit adultery and God can forgive you of adultery, but if the person you committed adultery with gets pregnant, then there are consequences down the road for you and your family, for that person and their family, and for the child who was born and on and on. So that is what I think it means when it says, I will not, uh, I will by no means clear the guilty. I'll forgive the sin, but you may have to deal with the consequences down the road of that sin. All right? God recommits or renews the covenant in chapter 34. Um, I want to give you two passages here, chapter 33 and then uh, chapter 40 to demonstrate the fact that God has specifically said, I will still be with you. Chapter 33, 1-3, Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised an oath, on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you, and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, per Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. Because you are stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. I'm so mad at you right now, I could flare up. This is where he says, I'm not going with you. And Moses then intercedes over and over and over. This idea of persistent prayer. He prays to God, please don't deny us your presence. Please go with us. Please be present there. And both in recognition of the fact that leaders can intercede, that he has made Moses the leader of these people and listens to him, and the fact that intercessory prayer does work, God then says, all right, I'll do it, I'll go with you, but keep a tight rein on these guys, because obviously they're not keen on this. And then by Exodus 40, this is toward the end of the whole chapter, or whole book, then the cloud covering the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travel of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. So the Lord's presence, he, he repented, and not to use that word like he'd done something wrong, but he, he reversed himself in saying that yes, he would continue to be present with them. He would dwell in their midst. He would go along with them even though they were a sinful people. And Moses had to try to then keep a, keep a tight rein on them um, because of their tendency to sin. And they continued to do it over and over again. One interesting thing, um, God's selection of Moses and his blessing of Moses was physically demonstrated. Whenever Moses would come down from the mountain, it says his face would glow. So much so that he wore a veil at one point, and he would sort of stay out of sight because it was so obvious and it scared people, apparently. Well, the description of that, as it got translated over the year, like, like in the Septuagint, when it's talking about rays coming out of his face, like his face was shining, it was glowing. Well, the word for ray, like a ray of light, um, got really mistranslated horn, that he had horns coming out of his face. 
And because of that, one of the most famous sculptures, this is by Michelangelo, the Michelangelo, the sculpture of Moses. Can you see? He's got horns. There are a number of very famous sculptures uh, of Moses in which he's got horns because of a mistranslation of this idea that his face glowed, that there were rays of light coming off his face because he had been in the presence of the Lord. Um, so if you're ever in Europe or anywhere and you see statues of Moses or any figure that otherwise looks like he's a decent guy and you've got horns coming out of his head, you'll know that's Moses and you'll know why because they mistranslated that passage. Okay. Um, any questions about any of that? Uh, when I was a kid, my dad was in France, and, and we went to Rome, and I saw that, and I, for years, I never could understand that. Why did Moses have horns? Yep. And, and years later, I found out. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. This, uh, I, I wanted to make a comment, too, about um, um, chapter 32. These, these chapters are just chucked full of truth. And, and in chapter 32, you see how these people were impatient. This Moses, he delayed coming down, and how we're so prone to impatience. And then the New American Standard says they they didn't just give their gold earrings; they tore them off. Mm -hmm. So there was an aggressive pursuit to 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 run after this idol. It was just it was just yep. in your face type sort of thing. And, you know, after what they had seen. So you have, and I, I thought how inclined we are to, to, to do those same things as human beings. As Christians, we're not, we're not, we've been changed, but as humans, we still do those things, even as well, Christians. Yeah, but inclined to, to rush towards idolatry by uh, self mutilation and <laughs> ripping the rings off, you know, so that you can offer something to an idol. Maybe not, but it was just powerful. Yeah, and this, this image that God had miraculously, through a series of plagues, brought them up out of Egypt. He had miraculously allowed them to evade Pharaoh's armies by opening the waters and letting them cross under our land and then closing the waters back over Pharaoh's army. He had given them, you know, he had sweetened the water that was no good uh, in Mara. He had given them water from the rock in another place. He had given them quail and manna, even though they didn't know what it was. What is that? Um, he had protected them from enemies in the desert. His presence was so obvious that they were all scared to death of it. All of this. And, the, and just because Moses wasn't there, they decided to worship other gods. After he had specifically said, that's number one and number two on the list of don'ts. Hmm. Who could tell? And Aaron... You know, leadership failed then at that point because Aaron didn't help. Ron? What a lame excuse Aaron gave. <laughs> it's funny. But Moses didn't even acknowledge it, it would appear. And I'm sure Moses didn't believe it, and I doubt that Aaron even expected him to believe it, but it's one of those cases like with Peter where it's, it, it, there could be a little footnote there that, well, Aaron didn't know what else to say. You know, he's just looking for an excuse. He's looking for any way out. i, I, I got to make up a, good, a big one here. It's going to have to be a whopper to get me out of this one. You see that almost later with Saul. Yeah, with Paul. you know, with, with Saul when, when he's when he's told to kill all the the, oh. the, the those those guys. He makes up excuses. And he makes up excuses and he's impatient and yeah. Self justification is a powerful motivator. It's one of the truths of life. You can write that one down. Self justification is a powerful motivator. Aaron's trying to justify himself, and so he makes up a really stupid lie because he can't think of a better one. And, Aaron, and Moses, as angry as he is, he still loves his brother, and he knows that God has used his brother and can't use him again, so he doesn't do anything to him, and Aaron continues to be a servant of God after that. But, I, was, uh, I was thinking of using it, but it's just too lame. What's that? That excuse. Oh, oh right. Next time. Next time you do something wrong, you'll tell Mary. Well, it just, it just came, out of, you know, came out like that. All right. Major themes in Exodus. I looked at this last week. Um, I want to revisit it because this is what both the, the departure from Egypt, God's miraculous deliverance of his people, and then the covenant when God makes his promise of a relationship commitment to the Israelites and then tells them how it is they're supposed to live to fulfill that. Themes include that the election, you are my special people. The election goes back to Abraham when he first said to Abraham. 
I will be your God, and you will be my guy, and then I will make of you a great people, and they will be my people, and I will give you a land. So the election, the special choosing by God, not because of anything that had happened. There was no indication that Abraham um, was particularly, should be chosen for that. Moses, you remember, Moses whined about everything. He had all these excuses for why he couldn't do this. And yet, God chose him and taught him and strengthened him so that he became a great leader. Secondly, covenant, the idea of a relationship, that we are going to pledge ourselves to each other. And the covenant has responsibilities on both sides. Now, the covenant with God, God had already demonstrated that he would accept, be gracious to, protect, preserve the Israelites then. All of the onus was on them beyond that point. Also of salvation and deliverance, which God, which God had demonstrated several different ways through this whole process. Delivered them from the hands of Pharaoh, through the Red Sea, from the Amalekites, from hunger and thirst, um, and then promises future deliverance as well. And then the theophany or presence of God. This more than any other single place, other than perhaps the incarnation itself, the presence of God in Jesus, that God said, I will be with you. And he gave him instructions for creating a place so that you'll recognize where I'm going to be. I will be at the tabernacle. That will be my dwelling place, my sanctuary, in your very midst. And you will be circled around that. So God promises to be present in the midst of the Israelites. There's also God's forgiveness. These guys really screw up. And they do it blatantly, flagrantly, after all evidence that they should pay attention and, and believe. And yet God still forgives them. And then finally, God's protection, which again, he already demonstrated from Pharaoh, from the Amalekites. God promises to continue to protect them. And the fact that um, history has been one long series of efforts to destroy the Jewish people. It starts, the, you know, Pharaoh tried to do it. The book of Esther is a, is a book entirely about a political, politically motivated effort to try to destroy the Jews. That didn't work. And on down to modern times. They tried in Russia. They tried in Nazi Germany. You know, um, anti-Semitism, the reason why that word exists is because there is something inherent. The devil hates the Jews and wants to destroy them and has always wanted to destroy them and has used every means at his, at his uh, disposal. And yet God has continued to preserve the Jews. And then adopted us, grafted us onto the vine of the Jewish people in order to give us access to the promise that he made, that he would be our God and we would be his people forever and ever. And we're grateful for that. Questions about any of that or comments? Well, I'm going to let you go early. Oh, Becky. Oh, I just had a comment of, um, here, how hard it had to have been, you know, it, you know seeing that Aaron uh, led them into building the altar, basically okay the deal, and then was told to go kill, you know, help kill some of the ones that he led into. Mm -hmm. That had to be very horrific. Yeah, and the weird thing is, Aaron didn't, didn't it doesn't say he led them uh, into right. building the altar and, and the gold again. He did it. Well, yeah. He did it for them. So he, he really, can yep. you imagine killing your neighbors that you cared for and you told them, you, you kind of did it. You know, yeah. it's your fault. You're the You're one that led us in this, yeah. That's really good. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's why teachers and leaders are all more accountable. I mean, it's, it's hard. Marvin? I throw back to last week a little bit. We talked about 600,000 men. I was doing some, some research a little later on. They do number all the different tribes. Mm -hmm. And there were 600,000. So that means there had to be a couple of million people. Uh, and um, so I, I believe that not only did they get manna and quail, they may have got some uh, special provisions for uh, sanitary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sanitation would have been an issue as well. After their animals. Well, there, 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 there were laws. There, there were laws. I, I don't remember where, if it's in Deuteronomy or maybe in Exodus, I'm not sure, where they were told how to handle their, their yeah. waste. waste. Well, they had to go inside of the camp and bury it, but as I said, if they were camped, it's a two and a half mile walk. Get to the edge of the camp. So, yeah. I think there's probably more miracles there that are not specifically. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the miracle of, of the latrine. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's good.